So in this video, I'm gonna talk about 25 gifts that anime has given the LGBT community. Now also keep in mind, regardless of the gift, it's still a gift. <laughs> Even if you didn't ask for it. Yuri on Ice. This is probably the lowest hanging fruit. <laughs> I could have chosen for this list, but I can't not mention it with the topic. But I mean, obviously you're in ice. There was the kiss. There's the canon romance. There was a phenomenon. It got all the gays to care about real life ice skating. <laughs> Kinjo in My New Boss is Goofy. Now I've already explained My New Boss is Goofy in a previous video. It's right on the thumbnail. So in a series that already has um bountiful, <laughs> Bountiful appeal to members of the LGBT community. Kinjo is the only really straightforward canon example of a member of the LGBT community because he's a character who has expressed both attraction to women and to men and also has gone on record to say that he has had both ex-girlfriends and at least one ex-boyfriend. <laughs> it literally was the entire title of that episode. Kunihiko Ikuhara. Ikuhara is a name that is basically synonymous with queer and genderqueer representation in anime. Most notably, you have Sailor Moon, which obviously not really per him, but he did direct the original Sailor Moon series. Also, the man who has worked on Utena. I have not seen Utena yet, uh, but Utena, from what I know, a lot of sapphics love that shit for the sapphic shit that goes on. Arguably my favorite from him, Sarazanmai! Anime Studio Dean! Studio Dean is the single, singular anime studio that without question for at least over one decade has been adapting BL and BL adjacent anime consistently, like, throughout all this time. They are not afraid to pick it up, unlike other places. Like Santa said, let me give you the list. Junja Romantica, Sekaiichi Hatsukoi, Hybrid Child, aka the Holy Trinity of Shingeki Nakamura, Super Lovers, watch my video on that if you haven't, <laughs> Gravitation, which is like a staple of many millennials, Sasaki Tamiyana, Kyo Karamao, Hitalia, 07 Ghost, Hakenen Toho Haken Ibun, and Upcoming, which I find hilarious. They'll be adapting the first ever Omegaverse BL anime, Tadaima o Kaili. Donika Naruhibi. Donika Naruhibi is basically a compilation film about three different stories about love and feelings and hormones. <laughs> One story is about like two adolescents who are like coming into their puberty and like how that affects them. It, it's a boy and a girl. A story about two office women who fall in love. And then is a story about a teacher and a boy who confesses to him and like the emotions he goes through because of that confession. Checks all the boxes you could say in terms of having like a boy-girl relationship, a girl-girl relationship, and a boy-boy relationship. Checks all the boxes. You don't really see that in most things. So regardless of the quality, of the story itself, itself, <laughs> its shelf, it still gives its gifts in its own way. They're not like major gifts. It's not like you, you get a Nintendo Switch. It's, it's like, it's a stocking stuffer. Male Idol Anime. I mean, obviously... <laughs> <laughs> Y'all know I will always promote male idol anime whenever I get the chance to. I should just do a male idol anime ranking video or whatever. Or top male, male idol anime ships. Because I have seen a lot of them. <laughs> I do have a lot of ships. But anyway, first of all, shout out Male Idol Anime, obviously for um, appealing to the men attracted across the board, which obviously includes other men. I want to make a special shout out. This is <laughs> this wasn't originally in my notes, but I'm going to say it right now. Special shout out to Seiji Shingen from Idol Master Side M, who is low-key like a gay icon. <laughs> <laughs> um, the gay manga doujinshi pornographic scene <laughs> of Japan. Shout out Seiji, I love him, that's my man. Male idol shows will definitely lean into pandering, which I appreciate. They also surprisingly go through the effort to often have trans characters, or at least characters who uh, take on more androgynous expressions. Notable representation include from Idolish 7, Kaoru Anasagi, who's Trigger's manager. From Utapri, there's Tsukumiya Ringo. From Ensemble Stars, there's Arashi Narukami. And then most recently and most notably, An from Paradox Live. Sharon's crush on Yukito and Card Capture Sakura. Like, I've already talked about this at length, very specifically within Card Capture Sakura. Sharon was a character I very much identified with because I already <laughs> talked about this in that video. That experience when, like, you're young and you don't quite understand, like, sexual attraction yet, but there may be an older man. <laughs> you very much are attracted to. Him and Sakura are not only rivals in capturing the cloud cards, but also rivals in love. Rivals to lovers, literally, actually. <laughs> they both have a crush on the same guy, even though uh, neither of them get with him, because <laughs> Toya swoops in to snag that up. Sengoku period series. Really like any series that like takes place in, I think, feudal Japan. From what I understand, like there are a lot of samurai, particularly where there was a lot of men-men relationships going on. Look into it carefully. <laughs> Some of it is like, uh, we can't exactly apply this to, to modern times, but it did exist and it does fit the bill, I guess. Japanese people, at least who understand this history from it being taught in school or whatever, can look at it and view it through a lens of like, oh, well, <laughs> a 
Oru no Oru Nobunaga in real life. And that just kind of adds its own rainbow undertones to it. But also I want to very specifically, uh, in regards to one of those series, my favorite Sengoku period series, Sengoku Basara, which I also been talking about a lot recently. From what I understand, the gender of Uesugi Kenshin, the real life person, is up for debate apparently. Basara does an uh, interesting job of continuing like the, the lore of Uesugi Kenshin being uh, androgynous. So shout out to him. Yuichi Nakamura, a voice actor. A no, voice actor. If you have shipped any two boys in anime, it's likely that in that ship, he voices one of the characters. <laughs> so let me just read off the list. Abe from Big Windup, Grateful Buster from Fairy Tail, Gojo from Jujutsu Kaisen, Hattori from Sekaiichi Hatsukoi, Ratio from Hamatora, Kuro from Haikyuu, Shifun from Ani Nisukuru, Shigure from Fruits Basket Remake, Hawks from Boku no Hero Academia, K from Psychopath 3, Marco from The Shaman King Remake, Kumatani from Uramichi, Shido from Blue Lock, although we haven't seen a whole lot of that yet, but I, I, I know spoilers. Do you know spoilers? Do we care about spoilers? Boys flirting and being flustered for comedic effect regardless of their sexuality. Some call it baiting. I call calling it baiting ungrateful. It's just something that I always appreciate, like male characters blushing at other male characters or like just flirting with each other even for comedic effect. It, it's hilarious. <laughs> my hormones jump, so I appreciate it. Just some notable examples of some of my favorite examples. Usui from Maid-sama kissing Yukimura. Soichiro Tachibana from Aoashi, just in general making boys swoon. Kamo, one of my favorite anime characters of all time, from Fuhu Ijo. Koibito Maman, being swooned by Minami. Kazuma Mutsumi from Kiss Him, Not Me. Saying Asuma should date everyone, and they're attractive. Also, that gender is just not a big deal when it comes to love. And then, of course, Hatsuharu from Fruits Basket, his general attachment to Yuki, and of course, the p scene. Hanabi Yasuraoka from Scum's Wish. Now, again, I keep hyping up this Scum's Wish video, so I'm like... <laughs> setting the standards for myself way too high. Scum's Wish, as we all know, is a series about this girl named Hanabi Yasaroka, and she gets involved with this cute guy with blonde hair. I think his name's Mugi. And so she has a crush on Onichan, Oni this like guy next door who like was her babysitter. And then Mugi has a crush on this woman who used to be and is then becomes again his teacher and or his tutor. And so they both have crushes on people that they can't be with. And so they decide to enter into like this like proxy relationship where they're going to to have a physical relationship and they're gonna date, but they're gonna date by pretending that the other person is the person that they actually have a crush on. People will associate and say like Hanabi Yasaroka is bisexual because she had a relationship with Ichan. I personally don't think labels are necessarily important at all, ever. What I wanted to highlight is just the fact that Hanabi, you have her getting physical and having like around with Mugi, obviously who was a boy, but she also enters into a physical relationship with Echan, and I feel like it's just overall a great representation, albeit in a, a convoluted <laughs> drama series. I feel like this does an overall good job of depicting the concept of experimenting with other people of the same gender, regardless of how you ultimately come to the conclusion of that. And I feel like we don't get enough examples of like people just messing around and whether that comes to fruition of like deciding they're queer in the end or not deciding they're not queer in the end or even like coming out of it and still not being sure and need, they're needing to be more beyond that. So I think Scum's Wish is a nice and novel example of that type of depiction. Anime Festa's BL selection. I already did a whole video on Anime Festa. Watch it if you haven't already. We barely get enough BL anime as it is, but Anime Festa fairly consistently, like maybe at least like once a year or like once every 16 months. <laughs> they at least give us like a BL series. Particularly, they not only give us BL series, but they give us BL series that actually have like physical depictions of affection and sexual attraction, which a lot of the other BL that gets made doesn't really have too much of. It didn't used to be this way. What the f happened? Shout out to the various series that they've produced. Titan's Bride, Evologia, Papadate Shitai, Mori no Kumasan, Korogal. And I believe they have one in the works called Ateyuma Kara no Kuse Shite Spadali Oji ni Choi Sarete Imasu. Vitriolic Boy Boy Ship Wars. Ship Wars in general suck. But the thing about Ship Wars is that like, and the thing about representation and think about inclusivity is like, if something exists, everybody should be included in that thing existing, even if it fucking sucks. While historically a lot of like major ship wars have been between like het couples, like is Toru gonna end up with Yuki or is Toru gonna end up with Kyo? Is her name Yuki? I have to still watch Vampire. Is Yuki gonna end up with Kaname or is Yuki gonna end up with Zero? And so like, you have like all these ship wars between heterosexual couples and those ship wars are often, oftentimes like very vitriolic. So shout out to the ship wars between same gender male couples that hold that same energy. Keep that same up vitriolic energy. Most notably Baku Deku versus Kiri Baku and of course Rin Haro versus Mako Haru and that's just within anime. Should I bring up Sheath versus k -Land? <laughs> Morlock from Benria Saito-san. Benria Saito-san is basically about this guy named Saito who's a handyman in his world and he's down on his luck and then he gets hit by a truck and he ends up in another world. In this other world he forms a party who goes like dungeon hunting and he tries to help them with his handyman skills and one of the people in the party is this old 
<laughs> super powerful mage named Morlock. Morlock throughout the series like very much shows his attraction to women across the board. But there's one part in the story where at one point gets his dog bitten off while he's sleeping by a dog. <laughs> by a demon dog, which absorbs his magical energy. It's a whole subplot. So they go on a mini quest to get Morlock's back and to get his magical power back because his magic power is now out of whack. So ultimately they eventually get Morlock's magic back. He doesn't get his back, I don't think like directly, but he does get his magic power back overall. And so then in the process of him getting his magic power back and then trying to like reform what was lost, his magic power goes out of whack and he ends up transforming into a woman. And in that brief moment, he's like, oh, you know, Saito kind of has a cute face. If I was born as a woman, I would have been attracted to him. And then eventually he does turn back to being a man. However, when he turns back to being a man, it turns out he's still attracted to Saito. So maybe the part about him, if he was born as a woman, wasn't exactly true. Oku, the inner chambers. I already did a video on Oku earlier this year. Aside from the feminism of it all, because feminism, of course, benefits the entire LGBT community. Oku I'm mentioning because there are depictions of men kissing men and men having and romantic relationships with each other within the Oku overall. But it created a cultural scenario where men were almost not forced, but like put in a posi position where they were around other men and thus became more open to being in relationships with men, either simply physically or romantically due to proximity to each other. And because of the very specific scenario that they had been put in where they weren't able to pursue female lovers, female relationships, have sex with other women at all. And an incredibly interesting kiss given the context behind the kiss. So I highly recommend Oku to anybody. It's on Netflix, it's new. Also by Studio Dean. Shout out Studio Dean. <laughs> The D in Dean is for sports anime in general. Sports anime overall is just like a candy store for those of us who consume media with a queer lens. Who like to put a little rainbow sprinkle onto anything. But specifically within all of that, shout out two very specific sports for covering all the bases in terms of same gender ships. Firstly, volleyball, because we have obviously Haikyuu and Niten Yonsan, which have boys, but also there's Harukana Receive. And then the second one being badminton, which has gotten a lot more adaptations in recent years, because we have iconic things like Hanebato. I wish you got more Hanebato, but also Love All Play and Riemann's Club. Kageki Shoujo. Kageki Shoujo is basically a story about this all women's theater troupe and the girls who are staying at the theater school in order to graduate and then join the theater troupe. Aside from having like massive sapphic undertones, also has like a cast full of characters who are thus practicing androgyny in addition to the sapphic undertones. Something of note why there's androgyny at all. It's all women troupe, so all the women play all the roles. So they play the men as well. And so some women are just known as being a <laughs> really attractive at playing male characters and like playing up their androgyny. So there's that. So there's a whole lot of women blushing around a whole lot of other women. <laughs> That my boyfriend in the series Tai Chi is gay. <laughs> because, and I quote, the Narata siblings are to have probably slept with every man in the city. This quote is brought up by the Narata sister, but Tai Chi is her brother. <laughs> That's the Narata siblings. If you can do math, Tai Chi is taking <laughs> slanging it everywhere. Bokura no Nano Kakan Senso, aka our Seven Days War. This is a movie about this boy who has a crush on this girl, and sh her father's like, we're moving away. And so to rebel against her father moving and her moving away, she doesn't want to leave her friends. The boy and her get a bunch of other random people, and they all end up going to this abandoned factory and hiding out for several days in order to prevent her from moving away. It's one of those like rebellious teenage stories. I literally cannot tell you why it's on this list. You just have to watch it and find out. <laughs> Episode seven of Revenger. Revenger is a story about this samurai who gets betrayed and he joins these group of people called Revengers who enact revenge for people who bite into golden coins. This is going to be spoilers for Revenger, by the way, at episode seven completely. <laughs> episode seven focuses on a story about this new monk who goes with his monk to a brothel and he doesn't know why they're at the brothel. Turns out they go to the brothel so they can sleep with male that are being pimped out by these evil nuns because it's like, oh, monks aren't supposed to lay with women. <laughs> it doesn't mean anything about laying with men. We love loopholes, but it's up. And so this new monk guy ends up sleeping with his and he doesn't want to sleep with the at first and the male is like, if you don't sleep with me, like they might kill you. Like they'll hear, like it'll be an issue. So he sleeps with him to like save the male essentially they kind of like have a little bit of a romantic thing going on and he's like i want to free you he's like but how are we going to do that and he's like i don't know when i come back i'll figure it out so the monk leaves the thing is that all these are also on opium addiction which is why they're able to be he's like hesitant about doing the opium and the evil nun sees and so she like injects him with like a more potent opium the monk comes back and he's like oh i don't know i couldn't figure out but like we'll just have to keep trying and then he realizes the guy is like 
picked up from the opium. And so he has him bite into a gold coin while he f***s the shit out of him emotionally, <laughs> of course. And so in doing that, uh, he asks the Revengers to take out the nuns essentially indirectly. So he stops being a monk because he has asked like people to like murder nuns. So like that's not very monkly. The Revengers end up killing the nuns and he gets re reunited with his um lover. He finds him in the slums and his hair's grown out and he's cuter than he already was. And it's great. Anime adaptations from the shoujo demographic. Obviously, these are anime adaptations from a manga that is specifically targeted to a specific demographic. And shoujo demographic overall, very much more so than its uh, separate but unequal counterpart shonen, <laughs> takes significantly more liberties when it comes to expressions of sexuality, gender, and subtext. Key examples of scary stories that have featured queer characters or any of those things I literally just mentioned. Fruits Basket, Sailor Moon, Kiss Him Not Me, Card Captor Sakura, or any other Shoujo series by Clamp, honestly. Oran Ho High School Host Club, Maid Sama, Banana Fish, Fire Emblem's Arc, and Tiger and Bunny Movie 2, The Rising. Now, Tiger and Bunny is basically like a superhero anime. If you haven't seen Tiger and Bunny, I highly recommend it. Fire Emblem, very specifically, is a character who is feminine presenting non-binary, I believe. Fire Emblem has a scenario in the second movie where they specifically are shown hallucinations about trauma associated with them, very particularly with them going to an all-boys school growing up and them having a to boys and that being a man is not very much not their gender. The whole sequence is incredibly interesting, probably traumatic for some people. Builds a lot onto Fire's character overall, but also shows their ability to overcome their trauma because ultimately they are able to defeat the hallucination by accepting who they are overall as a person. But yeah, Fire Emblem's favorite, second favorite character. Subaru's my favorite. I just love him. <laughs> He's pure chaos. Fire is definitely second. Sky High is third. Also Fire and Sky High in season two. Listen, listen. It was the ship I didn't know I needed. This one might be controversial, but surprising. Compulsory heterosexuality. I know y'all are probably like, what? What? <laughs> Is that a gift to the LGBT community? For those that don't know what compulsory heterosexuality, also known as compet, is, compet is essentially the concept of you have a story, whether it's romance or not, particularly it applies outside of romance, I would say, but I think a lot of romance series it also applies to. But essentially you have a boy and a girl and they go through the story and they don't really develop their relationship super well. Literally, it seems like they're only really attracted to each other and in love with each other because the story thinks they should be because they're a boy and a girl. You see this concept particularly used a lot through a lot of Weekly Shonen Jump series, a lot of battle series where like the story ends, there's an epilogue and like the guy is married to this girl that like they maybe sort of had some sort of something going on, but like maybe they talked just once and now they're married. Kind of like what is supposed to happen with the fourth ending that's probably not happening with Hunter Hunter. Gon's supposed to end up with that little girl on the island from the beginning apparently. It's a gift because it makes us appreciate what we do get. <laughs> what little we do get. I think without Compat, we wouldn't appreciate it as much. <laughs> Something. Samurai Flamenco, aka Sam Flam. Sam Flam is basically a parody series of Tokusetsu or Toku. Is it Tokusetsu? Tokusatsu. I always got my vowels. Up. Toku, it's basically a tokusatsu parody series with this main guy, I think his name's Masayoshi, and then there's this cop named Goto, and so they end up partnering along as Masayoshi tries to be a superhero, essentially, and so it's like there's a whole lot of uh, Super Sentai parody shit going on, and then ultimately in the end, Masayoshi confesses to Goto. Honestly, the most roundabout, like, subtextual way the story through various media related to it confirms that the two ultimately do actually end up in a relationship and end up married, according to the mobile games. There's also like, I think the lyrics of this ending theme song from the second verse that are used in the very last episode when the two are near each other also kind of mirrors or is giving like... <laughs> Insists to their actual relationship. Also feel like there was a lesbian or two in there as well, but it's been a while since I watched it. Hiroku Utsumi. This is a director. She directed Banana Fish. She directed Free Iwatobi Swim Club and Free Eternal Summer. And she also directed SK8 The Infinity. So she's on here because obviously she's directed a lot of series with a lot of shipability, with a lot of characters that are shipped with other characters. Also because she's like gaslit an entire generation into thinking that platonic friendships is the representation that we deserve. <laughs> And this last one is incredibly selfish, but Hercule winking at Goten in Dragon Ball GT. Uh, <laughs> uh what? So aside from the G and the T in Dragon Ball GT, obviously being a clear reference <laughs> to LGBT, even though Dragon Ball GT was... A, a, <laughs> aside from Goten's character design, same, I feel so seen. <laughs> so it must 
be representation. So those are 25 gifts that anime has given the LGBT community. In the comments below, leave some gifts that you think that anime has given the LGBT community or argue with me about some gifts that I said. Which of these gifts do you want a receipt for so you can return it again? <laughs> something else. Also, Scoutmaster season I have completely finished. So head over to my Patreon if you want to see both routes fully done along with a final review podcast of the entire game. My overall thoughts, favorite scenes, what I thought about it overall compared to the regular Camp Buddy. Also, this video will be available as usual, uncut, uncensored, with additional bonus content and an intro probably. But that's it for this video. I will see y'all in the next one, which will either be I might leak something. Um, or it'll be my top ships of 2023. Haven't decided which is coming first. Bye!